Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. I am Chavelli Carazana. I am the 19th Economy Reporter, and I will be moderating this wonderful panel with educators, administrators, and advocates. Thank you all so much for being with us. I wanted to start with a really quick status check. I'd love for each of you to quickly tell me where in the school reopening process you are, how you've navigated those first few weeks, and also for your folks as well, Randy. So, and also most of all, how are you? How are you doing? Uh, let's uh, let's start with the principals. Uh, Ryan, you want to go first? Hello, everyone. So my name is Dr. Ryan Daniel. I am um, a principal in the state of Maryland, and we are fully virtual. We are fully virtual until the end of January. So we open the building for the first time in distance learning. So we have been just navigating through um, the virtual learning world, um, using some of the lessons that we learned at the end of last school year and you know making adjustments and just kind of being flexible and rocking and rolling through it. We are almost... Uh, finished the first quarter. So we are midway through. What about you, Tanya? I know you all are opening uh, also virtual, but there are some students are back at school. Good morning. My name is Tanya Sudam. I am from the Thon Anthem Nation. I currently serve as the principal of Baba Kivri Secondary Campus, and we are 100% virtual um, through the first semester. Um, but virtual means online and packets. Um, and in addition, we do have to have um, kids on campus for those that need it. So I have about 12 students that are on campus. And and all your students are back in campus already, right, Lonnie? Yeah, I'm here in my office at school. I can peek through the windows and see my kiddos um, out in the commons and walking to and from class. I'm the high school counselor in Shadron, Nebraska, a really small town in the panhandle of Northwest Nebraska, very close to South Dakota, Wyoming. And since uh, mid-August the 16th, we have been back. Uh, we had about 10% of our kiddos opted to stay home uh, an enriched online learning program that we offered this year. But yeah, 90% of our kids are back. Uh, we are masked up at our school for the most part, and we are back to learning in person. Great. And Randy, you want to tell me about your <laughs> teachers? I know that's sort of a wide swath there, but you all represent what some 1.7 million members nationwide. How are, how are teachers uh, coping with these first few weeks back? So I would say that, um, so 70% seven, of the largest districts are basically virtual. And um, so, so let's, let's put that bucket aside for a second um, because I'm sure we'll get to that. The, um, and I, um, I, we represent most of the big places and a whole bunch of the medium size and then a bunch of rural places. So the places where um, uh, the, let's say the governors have been really serious about taking on COVID, those places have gone better than the places that have not. So because so that, and I'm so glad Lonnie said that people are masked up. So like in the places, none of the places we represent have gone full-time in person. Every place that we represent is either hybrid or is virtual. And for the places that are hybrid, there's been a lot of start, starts and stops where um, some of the districts have figured out how to fund, even though they don't have the money, the kind of protocols that are needed like masks and cleaning and physical distancing and ventilation and reasonable accommodation and things like that and hand washing. And then in some places, even when they've gotten to agreements, there's not a lot of trust. So like in Massachusetts right now, um, Boston had one of the best agreements there was, but then the COVID rate got up to 4.1%. And they said that if it was at four, they would close the schools again. So there's been a lot of sturm and drum. New York City has a great reopening agreement. It costs a lot of money. Um, one of the Washington Post reporters, the education reporter in a tweet last week said, yeah, all I, st I, I can't believe we're still having a conversation 
about money, school reopening in COVID is really expensive. And so New York um, has some hot spots. As a result, there's about 50% of the kids that are back in person, but the hundred schools that are in the hotspots are now on virtual again until um, the middle of October. And I say these things because the, the real issue that's going on is number one, how do you have safeguards and safety that the scientists tell us and how do you make sure that they are funded and resourced? Number two, how do you handle whether a child or a teacher or two or three have COVID, how do you handle that opening and closing on a school by school basis? And then number three, how do you handle a situation when either a zip code or, you know, or, or a school district is in a real hot spot and that you end up closing for two or three weeks? All of those issues are playing itself out. And I would say, People really, 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 really want to be back in school. We've done two polls that have shown 79% of our members have said that if the safeguards are there, they want to be back in school. 71% of parents have said that to us too. We did this polling with parent groups, but everybody want, really, really, really wants to be safe. And they want to know a consistent set of safeguards that they can rely on and that is enforceable. So I'm glad you bring that up because I really wanted to talk about the in-person aspect of this and what that's looked like now that we are several weeks in, right? Uh, for some, in some cases, safety was an enormous concern going into the start of the school year for parents and students, but also for educators, right? What that looks like for the folks who have to be with these large groups of students. So I would really love to hear about, for the folks that are back in person, what kind of precautions you did take. Are there others that you're now adding as you, as you go through this process and that are improving the day-to-day -day process? And how are the students dealing with these regulations? Lonnie, I want to start with you. I know you had a, a bit of a challenging start to the school year. We joke that uh, gold is forged in fire. And we went, <laughs> we had our fire um, the first two weeks of the school year for certain. And I think being in person, this is going to come in waves um, for us. And our first major wave of COVID came the first week of school. And we took extra time as a teacher group, as professionals, um, to go through the protocols, to go through the cleaning. We had our, it's, our public health came to us, um, worked with us. We've partnered really closely. We're in a very rural conservative part of the nation, but um, our district was committed to partner with them and not all districts in our state are. So we were following guidelines. We had everything set up and the very first week of school, the second day of school, both administrators and both high school secretaries in the building I work with uh, were, were diagnosed with COVID. And so um, da, 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 school counselor comes in and I got to learn all about answering all the phones and being a principal and, and stepping up uh, for those two weeks. But it, it was terrifying, to be honest, for the staff um, and for the students. It made everyone take it far more seriously. Um, it was we already had anxieties about starting school and adding um, that the whole high school office was shut down. A lot of phone calls I got personally that it, our kids seem to manage very well. They were very still in the excitement of seeing their teachers and seeing each other. So they seem to manage very well for the most part as the counselor in the building who kind of gauges that our parents really struggled. Um, and they struggled on both gamuts. I, I, I took a lot of phone calls saying, please, stay safe. We need you to run this school. We need to be back in session. A lot of our essential workers in the community were scared uh, because of the way we started school that immediately we were going to go virtual. And we didn't know it was a day by day decision, um, working closely with our public health to see if we could continue. Uh, luckily, it, it did not spread through the school. This actually was spread from an event that some individuals um, were at before school started. It was traced down to that. And luckily through our precautions and protocols that it did not spread through the school in that instance. And it stayed um, with those staff members. Uh, but it was, it was definitely an interesting way to start school. We were thrown into the fire um, and the, the anxieties then came out, uh, especially from the parents and, and the teaching staff for, for certain. 
And, and Randy, that's been a big concern for, for teachers as well this year. I know we wrote a story earlier in the year about teachers who were afraid to return to school, wanted to end their contracts starting at the, at the beginning of the year because they weren't, did not feel like their school was taking necessary precautions. Right. Uh, you, you mentioned the issue with that is still lingering with, uh, with budgeting. Where, where do you see us going and where do you see those um, really priorities that are still remaining to be addressed for teachers across the country who are really, really worried about safety moving forward and sort of this, this wave of, of potential cases that, that is ahead? So let me just, um, I'll, I'll say two things really quickly because, you know, I, I spend basically every waking hour doing two things right now. We're on a bus tour getting out the vote in 30 different states. Um, so I spent a lot of time on that, but I, every other piece of my waking hour is spending time on reopening in various different districts. Number one, back of the envelope, it actually will cost 25% more to reopen schools, both remotely and in person in this pandemic and we're basically, because of the recessions and the state, the contraction of resources in states, we basically have 25% less. So 90% of educators are actually paying for their own PPE. Um, and I'm so glad to hear Lonnie talk about how in her district, people are really focused with the public health people and, and things like that. That's number one. And there's lots of resource questions and they're really, and they will get more and more acute as the year goes on because a lot of school districts front loaded resources. Number two, one piece we, none of us have talked about yet is testing, 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 testing. Um, you, there, it is like, we're on this bus. I test at least twice a week. I have never been so excited to see a negative test. But you know, every time I see that, you know, I, but a test tells you where you are that moment in time. So that Los Angeles, New York, Boston, they're all creating strategies that you have a baseline test and that those kids and teachers who are in schools, there is randomized mandatory testing so that you make sure that you're constantly looking at what's going on in terms of COVID in a school and COVID in a community. Um, and it's not a protection. A mask is a protection. Testing is a, diagnos a diagnostic to actually know some data. So, so testing becomes a really important feature if we are in this moment of COVID increases, but even if we don't have a vaccine, say, in a, you know, for several months, how do you actually figure out what's going on in a community in a zip code if you don't have the data. So the testing becomes very, very important and it's very, very expensive. Absolutely, and, and I really wanna keep talking about safety. I think we're gonna, that's gonna be a through line of this uh, conversation. Uh, the other aspect to it as well, something you, you touched on a little bit uh, there, Randy, is the economic impact and how, how hurt a lot of folks have been this year. Uh, I know I have a few working mothers uh, that are here on this uh, panel with me, and I really wanted to talk about that Impossible Juggling Act because that's something we've written quite a bit about. Um, the pandemic has really upended the lives of working mothers. Last month, more women left the labor force and the total number of jobs that were added, some 865,000 workers. Some of that job loss has been um, in the education sector. And one of the reasons for that has been the child care aspect and the challenges with child care. So I wanted to see if you all could talk to me a little bit about that added strain of managing your own children's learning or childcare needs while also managing the needs of, of students as well. Tanya, I know you recently had to make a difficult decision on, on this point. Do you wanna, do you wanna start? Sure, um, going 100% virtual, you, you understand as a parent why um, in looking out not only for their kids, but for all of our staff members and our community members. And, but having to bring them here to my office and to try to lead uh, a school. So I'm trying to support my 363 kids that I have on uh, enrolled in our school, in addition to all of our teachers and staff, and then a first grader and a second grader. 
uh, was really hard, um, especially because technology uh, was a challenge and trying to help them navigate that. Um, and because they're, this is all information they haven't learned, it was hard just scheduling wise because there were two on two different schedules, um, had questions about everything. And I'm trying to do walkthroughs so I can um, support our teachers in a virtual setting. And, you know, it became a lot and it became too much. I noticed my focus was split. And so my decision making wasn't the, the greatest in, in work and my decision making at home wasn't always, you know, the best. And it put it, a, it put a strain on the relationship with my kids as well, because now I'm trying to have to teach and parent and, you know, those two different worlds are very, very different. And so it was really a challenge. And I had to make the decision for, for myself and for my kids that um, they went back to school um, this past week. And so it's been, it's been hard because I worry, I worry about them. I worry about the, the staff members that are working with them. Um, but at the same time, you know, I need to do what's best for them. And I also have to take a look at doing what's best um, here for my campus. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a balancing act, right, of, of understanding both sides of that challenge with the parent's point of view, but also the educator's point of view. Uh, Ryan, what about you? You have three kids, right? What is a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and a 13-year-old, yes. who I know some of them are off camera right now with your husband. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that how, how is that one? Yeah, that that the balancing act has really been something that has been a struggle, um, especially because, you know, virtual learning at the end of last school year and virtual learning the beginning of this school year are very different. Right. So we weren't prepared last school year, but we were better prepared this school year. So the demands, the expectation of everybody, including, you know, your children as students and then you as a leader, it, it has shifted. And um, so we are fully virtual, but um, I have to go into the building um, a, a hybrid model. So a few days after out the week, I'm required to go into the building and my children have to come with me sometimes, um, mainly my my four year old, um, because I we just I don't have someone to support her um, with distance learning because my, my husband is a police officer. So he has a high demanding job. I have a high demanding job. You know, we have a one-year-old. So just trying to balance and it has definitely been tough making sure that I am evenly splitting my time, my attention to my children, and then also, you know, my, my students, the parents, my staff, and I had to take a step back and intentionally block out time in my schedule for my children. And my secretary, my staff, they know that I have sacred time built in my schedule because I realized that my four-year-old, she was struggling seeing all of her other classmates have their parents sit in, you know, in the screen with them and they're helping them. And she's definitely independent. So she's able to do the things by herself, but she wanted me there because she sees all of her classmates there. Um, so it's the, it, it has definitely been um, a challenge just trying to find the balance because in, in one way, you know, you think you, you're, you may be doing great as a principal, but then, you know, you're, you're getting like a C plus as, as a mom or vice versa. And so I've just had to really figure out what works for my family, you know, what works for my building. I, I lead with love. I lead with a focus on family. Um, so I am constantly giving my my my, um, my staff opportunities where they can spend time with their children because I have a lot of teachers that are, are parents and I know the struggle. So I try to normalize us working at home. So my children have been in every staff meeting and every PD. We had one this morning and they were there and they were like, hi, just saying hi to, you know, my staff. And, you know, I make it so that like, it's okay. Don't apologize for having your children right there because we are all still trying to navigate through this and you know we, we're trying to figure out the best the best way to do this so it has definitely been tough just trying to figure out what works for me as a leader and then what works for me as a mom as well yeah absolutely Lonnie what has worked for you uh with your two kids in pre-k well I if anyone knows what works with a two and a five-year-old, please give me the advice <laughs> because um, <laughs> what didn't work was when I, the day I had to lead the staff meeting 
And I had the Sharpie in the top drawer and I thought they were being wonderful. I just thought they were, they weren't, I didn't even have to have cartoons on. They were fine. And my bedroom walls took a beating all over. <laughs> and, I, you know, and immediately it's just the letdown of you made it through this very important part of your day. You gave everything you had to your students. You, you feel like a wonderful worker and you walk into that room and I, to see the Sharpie all over the, the wall, I just bawled. I just started crying because I, you know, at that point it was like, darn it. I thought I did it. I yeah. thought I had it in this moment and I did not. So that was my experience um, from home. My kids had to go back because I have to be here in that. Um, it's hard. We have some vulnerable people in our family and um, it, it's an everyday battle to try to, um, you know, you feel really good. And like I said, it's in our community, it's come in waves. And so it gets scary from time to time. And, and my husband's um, one of only a few attorneys in town. So his job is pretty high demanding as well. <laughs> uh, kudos to the moms out there. I think it's no joke and no, uh, so it, it, this isn't a secret that the emotional labor of school has far been put on the moms. And I, I remind my teachers of that daily. Uh, when they call home, guess who they call? they call mom. They don't think twice about it. It is just instinctual that the, um, what, what we put on the mothers as far as education. So you throw a mom that's also a teacher or works in education administrator or school counselor into the pandemic where we're now, um, you know, we're the emotional labor of the, the education, we're the cook, we're the chef, we're the caretaker. Um, it, it is a lot, um, for, for everybody. So I got, I got my walls painted. We're good. All is well in my house. Uh, but yep, my kiddos are back now and they really needed some social interaction as well. Uh, physical touch, some of those things I think two and five-year-olds really yearn for during this pandemic. So they're, they're doing very well. And so are my walls. Great. Well, happy for your walls. So, <laughs> so look, you know, yeah, even when you're in the, like the grandmother stage, which is kind of where I am, the, the whole notion of not seeing everybody. So it's the day-to-day -day stuff that Ryan and Tanya and Lonnie talked about, but it's also this kind of long-term social isolation that everybody is feeling right now. And that families, you know, not, you know, not being able to, if, if families don't live close to each other, even over the summer, not being able to see each other not being able to hug each other, not being able to do the kind of rituals that families do all, all you know, over the course of the, the year. So that all of this, the, 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 the fact that COVID has lasted for so long and we're now going into another spike, well-being of, of people all across America, not just in terms of schools, but the whole notion of well-being and dealing with social isolation, this is going to be with us for a while. And we're going to have to have a lot of grace and we're going to have to think through, and this is part of the resource issue, how we get wraparound services around each and every school. Like, so Lonnie is not the only guidance counselor that's dealing in a Nebraska school, that Ryan has guidance counselors there, that we have, Tanya has um, social service supports. And so, you know, that's part of this is not simply getting like childcare grants, which we need to have so that women can balance work and kids and things like that. But it's gonna go deeper than the economics. It's gonna be really deep in terms of Maslowian social needs because of all of this isolation. Yeah. Yeah, and I think one of the really big issues that has come out of this that we were sort of honestly expecting before the start of the school year was how, and we have seen this already play out, how the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequities in our country and in every facet of it, and certainly in the school system and certainly in education. I wanted to hear a little bit from you all as well about now that we are a few weeks in, what are some of those persisting challenges, those things that you're still facing day to day, particularly with technology, I think in some cases that, um, that you're still dealing with? And do you have a better roadmap now on how to address some of those so that some students are not being left behind? Uh, Ryan, do you wanna go first? I know you have a, you're at a Title I school, right? 
Yes. So um, my my school is a Title I school, but we are also about 61% um, ELL population, where the majority of my families, um, English is their second language. And so that has definitely, definitely been the biggest challenge is that our students, they don't have the, the support at home um, of someone that can understand the language, can help them with one, navigating technology that is sometimes not even at the most advanced level, but it's just, it's basic technology that their families are just not, they, they don't understand. And then now having to help them with the language. So that has definitely been the biggest challenge. Um, my staff and I talk a lot about this, the pandemic um, has really shown us the, the inequities, the digital divide, um, you know, the linguistic challenges that um, we are facing, like we knew, but now we like we really know. And then for me, you know, I have as a title one school, you know, a lot of my families have been impacted by COVID and they are not working. So when we have opportunities where they can come to the school to get meals, when they can come to the school to get any um, resource as far as paper and pencils and just, you know, manipulatives, my line is wrapped around the parking lot. Right. And so those are challenges that um, we we had to prepare for. And so, you know, one of the, the, the shift for us is that we learned what worked and what didn't work in um, at the end of last school year. And um, we were very fortunate to have a great start of distance learning, which we joked about even this morning that that almost kind of has put us in a tough spot because our, our families have this expectation of us because, you know, we did so well in the, in the springtime. Um, so what we've done um, definitely in the beginning of this school year is that we provided um, student resource kits that had everything that they could possibly need um, for distance learning. And we took, we looked at the curriculum um, for the first semester, for the first quarter, by week. And we thought of different things that we had in the building. And we just started pulling stuff from classrooms, um, creating these kits, everything from crowns and pencils and construction paper to manipulatives for students, whiteboards for students. Of course, their textbooks gave them headphones. Um, we are one-to-one. Uh, when it comes to technology. So making sure that every student had a device and, you know, uh, when the students have difficulties with their devices, you know, we're IT. I sometimes feel I'm more of like an IT call center than the principal. You know, I'm walking parents through, okay, log on this, okay, share this. And then after a lot of times I'm just like, can I just speak to your student? I, I, I'm just going to walk him through it, right? Because it's, it's difficult, but, you know, we are really just trying to, give our families as much support as possible. We are also a community school. So we provide wraparound services for our, our, um, our students. So we have mental health professionals that support them. We realize that the, you know, our students are missing the, the, the physical um, touch, that uh, relationship, that engagement. And um, we are really big on climbing and culture in our building. So we are doing daily live morning announcements. We're doing assemblies. We have live socializing blocks. Our school district really has given us the autonomy. Um, our CEO has um, designated all principals as COOs of their building. So we have the autonomy to create the schedule that works for our school. And that has really been impactful because I was able to look at what did not work for us as a community last school year and make those adjustments and give parents, you know, breaks within the day, um, you know, making sure that it is not a eight to two of just sitting in front of the computer, but they give, you know, blocks of time and opportunities. And because I'm gonna have a high Hispanic and African American population, I have families that have multiple children, you know, that have parents that are helping other families. So they're babysitting, you know, two other children and have three of their own in the house. And so keeping that in mind when I'm building schedules so that they can, you know, divide themselves between a kindergarten student and a fifth grade student, right? So keeping all of those things in mind has really um, kind of helped us navigate through some of the challenges and things that we that are really out of our control.
really understanding the challenges that are happening in the home and being kind of a, a bridge there. You know, what about you, Tanya? I know that hotspots and Wi-Fi and connectivity has been a really big issue for you, for your students as well. Uh, yes, it has. And, you know, in that's the, the biggest challenge in a virtual model because that's the only way we can deliver instruction. And so when it's not solid 100% of the time, uh, you're going to lose kids uh, because they're missing out on instruction. Um, and, you know, our utility authority has been um, really great in trying to help figure out a system to support all families with internet. Um, but there are some communities that are, are rural um, and don't have that great service. And so we are also a one-to-one -one district. Um, so we were fortunate enough to be able to roll out those devices as soon as we um, went virtual. Um, this year, our superintendent has purchased uh, 200 internet ready devices. Um, in addition, we do have hotspots, um, but you know, as I mentioned, where some of our communities are rural, so the, the reception and the internet connection is really as on, is good, only as good as uh, the cell service in the area. So sometimes that's a challenge. Um, we too, like Ryan, we have multiple children in the family um, and that's, that's a struggle when they're all on different schedules and everyone's connected online. Um, we do have some families that uh, requested packets, and that has been an additional challenge because delivering uh, solid direct instruction over the phone is is hard. Um, and our teachers are teaching from nine to two. Uh, we were also given the autonomy to uh, build a schedule that works best for us. Uh, last year, our students had eight periods. And so when we went virtual in March, they were so overwhelmed to open up their computers and see eight different Google classrooms with all of these assignments. And it was just so overwhelming that some of them said, yeah, I open it. And then I see all of these things and then I just close it and I, and I put it away. And so then they're just falling further behind. Um, and so this year they only have four classes, but it's still a challenge because, you know, we assume our older kids are tech savvy um, and they are with certain technology, but virtual learning is a different set of um, technology that they're not familiar with. So we spent a lot of time really going through and teaching them how to use Google Classroom, how to use the different online platforms um, that we have, but it's, it's still a challenge. And you know, for us, especially my high school students, I, I worry because they need a certain number of classes that they have to pass in order to graduate. You know, I'm really concerned about my seniors who are, you know, they're already feeling down because this is not how they wanted to spend their senior year. And so, you know, we're also dealing with the social emotional piece of, you know, not being here, not having the nest, the all of the support um, that they would normally have coming here. Uh, you know, our counselors are working really hard to set up a system to deliver services virtually. Um, but that's still really challenging because it has to be done either over the phone or on the computer. So I can't just walk into a classroom and pull out a kid and say, hey, I need you to come talk to the counselors. Can I get you to log on to meet with our counselors to provide additional services? And so it's it's been it's been a challenge. And, you know, I'm the only school in our district that is seeing an, uh, a rise in numbers for students and families that want to have um, them come to campus. Um, and so we're supporting in any way that we can, um, because I want them to do, I want them to do the best that they can in the environment that works for them. And so it's been, it's been a, it's been a journey. Um, but I'm blessed to work with, you know, teachers and staff that are willing to be flexible and throw out ideas and try new things. Um, because really, that's where we're at. How can we um, best serve our students, you know, our, our, our reservation is the size of Connecticut. So our kids aren't in necessarily in close proximity um, to our school. So then how do we, you know, still provide those outreach services for kids that maybe live an hour away? Um, and, you know, so we're doing, we're doing what we can and we have um, the, the support of our superintendent and the governing board and our community members. So I'm really grateful that, you know, everyone's putting their heads together to figure out how can we serve our kids and make sure that they're um, not losing any anything this year? Those are impossible big questions that we're addressing this year and that we're going to be addressing, I think, long term. And so that's where I wanted to take you all now. We've been hearing from educators who are really afraid about the impact a year like this could have on this profession, on the educate on ed education in general. And you know, what if you know standardized test scores aren't, aren't don't, don't come in well? What if uh, evaluations aren't aren't well? What if our kids are not where we want them to be? Is that going to reflect 
on parents and students and teachers, or is that gonna reflect on this system? So I would love to hear from each of you about what are your fears about how this year will impact education? And where do you think are the opportunities to really learn from the challenges of this moment and improve the system moving forward? Uh, Randy, I I'd love to start with you on that one. So I think we have to actually start with saying um, three things at the same time. Number one, there are Herculean efforts that are being made by the educators like those you have on this Zoom, by educators all across America, Herculean. Whether it was last March when people kind of moved in a nanosecond to virtual with all the issues that you've just heard and people kept on trying because teachers and kids have a special connection to each other. They knew each other before they, and, and, and people kept trying to figure it out and created some sense of normalcy in a very unnormal situation and some sense of calm and stability, schedules, routines, as well as learning. This year, you have a whole different set of constructs, both virtually and non-virtually. Non-virtually, it's nightmarish for a lot of teachers who are in school right now because the one, the one idea that actually has to be thrown out is you cannot live stream teach. You can live stream perform, but you cannot live stream teach and also teach in person at the same time and, and think you're gonna reach all kids. It's impossible and a lot of districts because of finances are doing something like that in the hybrid. But this year, and, and I'm so glad to hear both Ryan and Tanya talk about all the things they're doing in terms of virtual, because this year, teachers don't necessarily know their kids like they knew their kids last year. And that creates a whole nother set of, of, of situations. So the fact that, and I, I'm sorry to be critical about this, but the fact that the only guidance that Betsy DeVos put out was, oh, by the way, there will be standardized tests this year. It became laughable to everyone because we do actually have to figure out how to you know, measure this year and figure out where our kids are. But that's the first piece of guidance, as opposed to how are we gonna make sure that our kids have well-being? How do we make sure we protect them? How do we make sure we create routines and standards and make sure they feel like they're safe? And so what teacher unions are saying around the country and teachers are saying is this year is gonna be different than any, hopefully than any other year forthcoming. Hopefully we'll get out of this but we gotta figure out how to give people feedback about what to do this year, but it's not about how to evaluate them or, or create accountability. We gotta figure out how to make this year a bridge year so that kids are safe, teachers feel safe, and that we actually try to create routines in a way that, that's welcoming and, and that they feel like they're gonna be okay and get some learning. And, and if we do that, then we're gonna find pathways as every single one of these educators are, sh are showing you pathways to learn it. Yeah, I agree, Randy. I know my, my staff and I talked about that. What we thought was normal is, is gonna change. Um, you know, education changes now as we move forward. Um, our thinking, our mindset has to shift. And you know the way we used to operate as, as school districts is is going to change. You know everything from as simple as snow days. We have shown that snow days they don't exist anymore because we have shown that okay we can virtually teach online. Students have the access. We know what to do. Um, but even you know when we come back and uh, bring students back to school, everyone may not come back at the same time. Right. My my 13 year old is as is at a school that the teacher is teaching to the students that are at home and the students that are sitting in front of in front of her at the same time. Right. And that is something that our teachers have to prepare for the thought of that. You know, we have to prepare for, you know, as elementary, I may not be able to do whole school assemblies anymore. I may have to break it up and only have a certain amount of students at the same, at, you know, at a time. I may not be able to have parents in the building as much as I, I have before, right? Everything kind of shifts and changes, but, you know, 
I have been challenging my staff to look at some of the positive things that comes out of, you know, navigating in distance learning, virtual learning, or even, you know, how we've had to adjust our practices for teaching and learning and focus some on some of the positive things, things that we didn't even know we had the capacity to do before this opportunity. Um, and I, I think it starts with us as the leaders, how we um, encourage, you know, how we set the example, how we motivate our teachers, um, you know, to, to really shift their thinking and um, prepare themselves for what new and what normal will be as we move forward. You're making some changes in your school too, right, Tanya? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, the other three campuses in, in our district, um, their, their leadership team and our leadership team sat down and, and took a look at what the expectation was um, because our teachers have teacher performance goals in order to receive uh, 301 money. Evaluation is a part of the, the system in order to determine whether or not you get 100%, 80% or none at all. And so, you know, it was really how do we support our teachers because we want them to keep pushing through, want them to, you know, take those risks. And yes, some of them will pay off big and some of them may crash and burn, but that's okay because at least they're trying, they're trying new things in order to reach our students. And so when we took a look um, at our evaluation tool, we use the uh, Charlotte Danielson framework with the 22 components. That is a lot, that is a lot to evaluate in a virtual setting. And so the message for, for us is, you know, this evaluation tool is not evaluating who you are as a classroom teacher. Um, because it is very, very different to be a classroom teacher and a virtual teacher. Um, it's really going to take a look at how you are as a brand new virtual teacher. And so we sat down um, as a, a leadership team with my campus and then the other campuses to come up with the modified version of what that looks like. Um, a lot of the things that teachers are doing already, it's just now strengthening, strengthening those pieces in a, in a virtual setting, um, because there was a lot of anxiety about uh, evaluations this year. And what's that going to mean, um, not only for their, their 301 money, but for their jobs for the upcoming year, you know, and we just really wanted to communicate that, you know, it's not going to be solely based on this year, because it can't be because everyone's learning. And, you know, I don't have a single teacher who's not trying new things. I don't have a single teacher who's resistant to making those modifications. So I, <clears throat> the best thing I can do um, and my leadership can do is support. So we do a lot of walkthroughs um, to support that. And we've shifted um, how we, how we conduct those walkthroughs. So that way we're providing them with real strategies for being in those effective categories. Cause none of our teachers want to be ineffective or developing. They really want to work to being the best possible teacher they can. And so um, I think we've kind of relaxed, um, the their feelings about it because now their anxiety isn't as high um, we're conducting you know two informal observations before we do the fo formal um, really because we want them to be confident in our ability to score in a virtual setting because I've never had to you know evaluate um, online before but then also to give them feedback before that formal and so they can knock it out of the ballpark you know in the spring yeah yeah and, and I want to, I want you to round us out here, Lonnie, on the mental health aspect from the counselor aspect. That's something that students, teachers, parents, everybody is dealing with this year. You know, what, what can we really learn to improve some of those outcomes uh, for, 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 for everybody? Well, I've been talking a lot with my students and my parents and community. Um, you know, this discomfort that we're all feeling, it truly is grief. Um, and we all go through stages of grief at different times, which can be challenging when you're trying to um, be one school counselor in a group of 350 kids because you might have a kid that's still stuck in anger or a parent. Why are they making me wear these face masks? This is, you know, I'm going to go to the school board. You know, we might have somebody who's in bargaining where they're saying, well, it, we'll, we'll wait for a graduation ceremony or we'll wait for this big event. We'll wait for homecoming. If it's just two more weeks, it'll be better we'll wait for our, our dances and you, you catch it and you, you catch this and it's all stages of grief. Right. And we all get to this acceptance at a different phase. Um, and some of what we're feeling right now and our students are feeling is anticipatory grief. You know, we are anticipating a very different holiday season. Again, we are anticipating these things in the future. We do not know how they're going to look and we can't control them. They're a little bit out of our control. Um, 
So the, the number one thing we can do as educators right now is just to stock up on compassion because that snippy comment by our colleague, whether it be via Zoom or um, in the teacher's lounge or a student that's acting out in class um, or an administrator who makes a comment that really hurts your feelings, it, it's nice to step back and look and say, they're, they're in an uncontrollable situation right now. That is grief and that is stress. And that might even be anticipatory grief. That's not how they usually act. I can find compassion for that um, to get to the next phase of this. Because as Randy said, we are in this for a while, whether we are virtual with our students or in person, or maybe we have to bounce between both in places, we are in this for a while. And to just that, that stocking up on compassion and recognize that, that our students might be grieving and our parents might be grieving. We talked about moms um, at home for a little bit. It's really interesting right now for me. There are, especially as my colleagues, there are some that have more to give right now than they have ever given. They just have, they're at the phase in the life where they have the time, they have the energy. It was like their call to arms. You know, first it was the nurses and, and our clerks and our grocery store workers and all these essential workers. And now it's us and the capacity they have is just huge. And then there's some of us with two and five and 13 year olds and are trying to, to play these different roles that we're used to giving so much and now find ourselves in this strapped a little less and it's confusing. Um, so I think for all of us just to, to fill that bucket with compassion and recognize the grief when it comes and recognize the stages that we all might be at different ones depending on the day and the situations in our communities. Let's just hope that we're all getting a little bit closer to that acceptance stage, right? And you know, I really want to thank you all so much for this robust conversation. I think this is an absolutely critical, critical conversation to be having and to keep having as the months uh, continue to go on. So we want to thank you so much for having, uh, for being here with us. And we so appreciate all of the work that you do, have done, and will continue to do. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.